morning. Glad everyone's here today. And uh, this is just one of these sermons. That it's just not. It, it's going to be like a history lesson. Okay. I'm really just going to fill in the blanks of this prophecy that was given to Daniel by the angel here in Daniel chapter 11. Um, if you didn't read the Bible, you can turn to page 730 in the few Bible and it'll be there. Um, there was no way I could get this chapter into one because it's like 45 verses. So we are going like verse 1 through 19 here in chapter 11. <coughs> but I did, um, I'm tired of God keeps his promises. And we're going to see how God does keep his promises, that he fulfills his word. We know in Isaiah 48, it says the grass withers, the flower fades, but his word stands forever. And, and so we're going we're, we're gonna to talk about God keeping his promises and, and doing this. And I'm not going to read these uh, 19 verses and then come back and reread them. Um, I will break them down as we go along um, in the sermon. So, so stay there in First Peter, or First Peter. Stay there in Daniel, and um, I will I will get to it. I promise. So if you will just pray with me, Lord Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the ability to come and worship you today, and, and Lord, just be able to go to your 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 table of communion to. Uh, Break bread, and Lord, and just be grateful for what your son did for us, that he came and, and, and took our penalty and, and the wrath that we deserve. God, I'm so grateful I was able to sing songs of praises to you today and, and read, read from your holy word and just pray. God, just be able to come and worship you. And now, God, I pray as we come to this time of, of this message, I pray that that these words spoken here are going to be your words. Lord, I know it's only through your strength that I'm able to do anything, that I'm able to come here and I humbly come to your cross. Lord, just, just ask you for your strength. Thank you, God, for what you do. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, promises are funny things, aren't they? I mean, have, I mean they're, they're really easy to make. Well, I promise to do this and I promise to do that. I mean, it, they come out really easy. The promises are generally hard to keep. I mean... People give a promise about something that they wanted, you know, as a, as a kid or, or something. I'll promise I go clean up my room. Mom or Dad, if, if you can just give me this, this new Game Boy or this new, you know, <laughs> and they get that new game, and guess what? The room never gets cleaned, right? You know, promises, you know, they're easy to break. You know, they get something they want out of the promise, and then they, then they just forget about the promise that they made. Or perhaps when somebody made a promise, they, they really meant to honor that problem. But now the circumstances in their life has changed, and, and now it's going to be detrimental for them to keep that promise, so they don't keep that promise. We've all had it happen to us, haven't we? We've all had promises broken to us, and I would, I would be willing to bet that, that most of us have broken promises before. I know that I always have good intentions on uh, keeping my promises, when I promise I want to do something, but I know I have broken promises. Not because of any other reason, but I just wasn't able to follow through or whatever. My intentions were right. But we've all been on both sides of that of that, um, of that wall, I guess. You know, election's coming up, and we know good and well all these politicians are going to be breaking their promises, <laughs> what they're going to be running on. I mean, they, they just say whatever they say. We know that the exact opposite is probably going to happen. Let me tell you what. What I want us to know today, I would really want us to, 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 to take away from this message today is that God is a God who keeps all his promises. There is not a single promise that God has ever made, that he has ever, any prophecy he has ever told, or anything in the Bible that will not, that he will not keep. Period. Point blank. He keeps all his promises. Every single one of them. If he hasn't kept them yet, that means one day he will keep them. In the future, we saw last week that, this, that, that there's this great cosmic war going on between between the forces of God, His angels, and and, and the demonic forces of Satan and His angels. It, it is a it is a great war. It's a, it's a battle to to influence the souls of the people, to, to for the behavior of the people, for behavior of nations. And we see that this war, that this battle, it is it is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and, 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 and things that, that we cannot see. And the, we saw this glimpse of spiritual warfare as this as demonic forces try to keep an angel from delivering a prayer to Daniel. Okay? 
to deliver the answer to that prayer to Daniel. It was an important prayer. It was a plea to God to protect the Jews who returned back to the promised land, who have returned back to the, to the city of David, to Jerusalem, to rebuild that city, to rebuild that, that, that temple there in, in Jerusalem. So, and, and they have fallen under persecution, uh, of being very oppressed by the people surrounding the nations. And, and, and so that's, that's why Daniel was praying for this remnant to, to, to be protected. So they could fulfill the God-given purpose uh, uh, of uh, which the, the, the Messiah would come through. Because that's where he was coming through. He was coming through that. Through those people there. That remnant there. This present scripture is really a remarkable prophecy. It predicts the history that would begin with the Persian Empire of Daniel's day. And it's going to run right up to a guy named, and I've talked about this guy, Antiochus Epiphany who is really a, an antichrist, type of antichrist. And, and so this, 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 this prophecy is going to run that whole length of that. Now this, we need to understand, is what's going on in Daniel's day. Okay, we, we, we understand that this is a prophecy from Daniel's day. And, and, and <coughs> you know, they don't have the, the liberty that we have to look back at this prophecy and see how it came true. And so there's going to be a lot of, like I said, fill in the blanks. A lot of theologians, a lot of people um, who have gone back and, and filled in the blanks for these for these prophecies that that that, that Daniel was given. And we're going to see that that they, how they all have come true in just these first 19 verses. And then next week will be added on to this. But there's five prophecies we're going to see in this week. So if you look at the scripture, and and, and we'll kind of dig into this. Verses 1 and 2 is the first prophecy. It says, In the first year of Darius, the Mede, I arose to be an encouragement and a protection for him. And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings are going to arise in Persia. Then a fourth will gain far more riches than all of them. As soon as he becomes strong enough through his riches, he will arouse the whole empire against a realm of Greece. And so this is really concerning three rulers of the Persian Empire. The kings that were really important to biblical history that we see Cyrus there in the Persian Empire. The first king was, was a guy named Cambyses, Cam, 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 who he ruled from 530 B.C. to 522 B.C. The second guy was, was Smerdis, S-M-E-R-D-I-S. He ruled in 522 B.C. I guess he just got killed that one year. I'm not sure to go into detail. And the third king was Darius the first. Of Hostapicus, okay? That was his name, and he ruled from 521 B.C. to 486 B.C. So we see these three kings, okay? And, 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 and what they ruled and, and where they ruled from. But then there was a fourth king. And this guy is, is Exerces the first. And he would arise. He's far more powerful than these other three kings, okay? And we see there that, that he is that fourth king that they're talking about. He arises. He grows really powerful, really strong, and, but he really makes a mistake and, and, he, and he goes after the, the Greeks in the, in, the, in, the, in, that in, in the in the Christian Empire. Okay? Because what he does, and, and we look at verses 3 and 4, and it says, And a mighty king will arise, and he will rule with great authority and do as he pleases. But as soon as he has risen, his kingdom will be broken up and parceled out towards the four points of the compass. And not of his own descent, nor according to his authority which he willed, but for his sovereignty he will be uprooted and given to others beside them. We, we should kind of know who, who that who that Christian ruler is. I mean, we've talked about him, and we have to kind of understand that 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 is Alexander the Great. Okay, so this king in exertion goes into Greek and. He just makes Alexander the Great man. Okay, basically what's happening. And so Alexander the Greek, Alexander the Great rises up, conquers. I mean, he just he just goes and just conquers nation after nation. I mean, he he conquered the known world. He just he had a lust for power. He was driven by that. Swept across the face of the earth and conquered all these nations. And and, and we see that that, that he was um that, had everything going. 
that after nine years, at the pinnacle of his power, he died. He, 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 you go back to the history books and read that he had a high fever, and he died of that fever. And so he had two sons. And, and the scripture says, even though he has descendants, it didn't get left to the, his descendants, but it got divided up into four different parcels. We, we've talked about that earlier in Daniel, and, and, and we, we see that, that since he died, how it's going to be the four generals got, got divided up to them. But they never were strong as Alexander the Great was, okay? And, and so they couldn't really hold on to that uh, and, and achieve the power that Alexander the Great had. And so we, we see that, that now Alexander the Great's came, he conquered, he died, he got split up. To these four four generals, so that's that's where we're sitting at, and now we're going to look at this third prophecy, um, which is just in verse five. And it says, "Then the king of the south will grow strong, along with one of his prince, who will gain a centenary over him and obtain dominion. His dominion will be a great dominion indeed." So, this prophecy here is for the king of the south, which is Egypt, and the king of the north, which is Syria. Two kings, the first king um, uh, uh, of the south, it, it was Ptolemy, P T O L E M Y. That's how you say that. Um, spell that name. And, and the other one was Seclusius the first Nicar. And what, what they were is, is, is Ptolemy was, was a very um, high ranking general, really strong. And then this guy was a high ranking officer. So and so they got split up, and one of them was in control of Egypt, and the other one had control of Babylon. But Seleucius, who was appointed over, over, over Babylon, was attacked. He had to flee for his life. And so he ended up going to Egypt with Ptolemy for his protection. And then when Seleucius got, got strong again, with his, he went back and, and retook Syria and me. So we see that these two um, kings... Okay, this is this, and what, what is setting up now is going to be the stage for the rest of this study today. So we got Ptolemy, who, who's the king of Egypt, and then we got Seclusius, who's the, the ruler over, over Syria. <coughs> and we see that that's what these two prophecies are. Um, and, and these two, between these two, the rest through verse 19, we're going to see um, how, how these two play a major role in this. Um, vision or prophecy that the angel gave Daniel. So verses 6 through 12, it says, After some years they were formed and alliance, and the daughter of the king of the south would come to the king of the north to carry out a peaceful arrangement. But she will not retain her position of power, nor will he remain with his power, but she will be given up along with those who brought her in and the one who served her as well as the one who supported her in those times. But one of the descendants of her line will rise in this place, and he will come against their army and enter the forces of the king of the north, and he will deal with them and display great strength. Also the gods with their metal images and their precious vessels of silver and gold, he will take them into captivity to Egypt. And he, will, and, and he on his part, will refrain from attacking the king of the north for some years. And the latter will enter the realm of the king of the south, but will return to his own land. His sons will mobilize and assemble a multitude of great forces, and one of them will keep on coming and overflow and pass through, though he may again wage war up to his very fortress. The king of the south will be enraged and go forth and fight with the king of the north. Then the latter will rise a great multitude, but that multitude will be given into the hand of the former, and while the, when the multitude is carried away, his heart will be lifted up, and he will cause tens of thousands to fall yet he will not prevail. And that's a lot. Okay, when you're trying to read through that, you're trying to figure that out, that is a lot. But, but this concerns the dominance of Egypt over Syria. That's what we see in this prophecy. And the angel really gets five different significant historical facts that really happened here. First, the two dynasties, they, they were kind of forming our lives. The, the agreement is that for the two rulers that, that, that Potomac, the king of Egypt, would give his daughter Berenice into marriage over the, the king of, of, of Syria. And then they would have a son, and that child would be the king of Syria. But that plan didn't come through. We see that, that uh, we 
but she will not retain her position of power. What had happened is, is that the, the former king of Syria's wife, ex-wife maybe, wanted her son to be king of Syria, so she killed her former husband and the daughter of Potiphar, so her son could, could, could reign as king. And you know, like I said, you can go back and you can look at these things and you can dig it up and you can see that that, that would happen. So that alliance between the two kingdoms never came about. And thirdly, the, 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 the prophecies include the prediction that the brother of Berenice, the one who, was, who got killed, was to see his father, he would attack Syria, he would attack Syria and avenge his, his, his sister's death. And then we see that Daniel's vision including predictions concerning the son of Seleucius, who succeeded him, that they mobilized a mighty army, or at war, and they overwhelmed those who they attacked. And then the king of Egypt, which would be uh, part of his son, down to the fourth generation, would march out against the king of the north. He would defeat Antiochus of Syria, and he would have great victories, but in the end, God's God's um, judgment would come upon him and he would die. So that's where we're at now. So we see that they're still battling, that the, there's prominence of, uh, of Egypt that dominates Syria. Now we're going to look at the, the last part of this, and this is where we're going to see where Syria is going to dominate um, Egypt. And we get in verse 13, it says, The king of the north will again raise a great multitude than the former, and after an interval of some years, he will press on with a great army and much equipment. Now those times many will rise up against the king of the south. The violent ones among your people will also lift themselves up in order to fulfill the vision. And they will fall down. Then the king of the north will come up, will come cast up a sea drink and capture a real fortified city. And the forces of the south will not stand their ground, not even with their choicest troops. For there will be no strength strict to make a stand. But he who comes against him will do as he pleases, and no one will be able to withstand him. He will also stay for a time in the beautiful land with destruction in his hand. He will set his face to come with the power of the whole kingdom, bringing with him a proposal of peace, which he will put in effect. He will also give him the daughter of a woman to, to ruin it, but she will not take a stand for him or be on his side. Then he will return his face to the coastlands, and captured many, but the commander will put a stop to his scorn against him. Moreover, he will reply him, repay him for his scorn. So he will return his face towards the fortress of his own land, but he will stumble and fall and be found no more. So I said that this last prophecy, we see a, a shift in power taking place. It was that, that Egypt had dominance over Syria, and now we see that Syria is going to take dominance over Egypt. Like we see the king of the north coming over to the king of the south. This is a prediction, a prophecy of Daniel. I mean, we could go back and you, and you can look at these events. Daniel and them didn't, you know, it's just a prophecy that what he's given out. And there's going to be a rise of, of a guy named Antiochus III. And he was so powerful that the historians refer to him as Antiochus the Great. And he, and he, and he's going to, his son is the one that's going to carry us to the ruler of Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay? So we see that, that he's going to bridge that gap so we get to, to that guy. Um, the angel predicted that Antiochus the Great would mobilize a great army, invade Egypt, Palestine, and Phoenicia, that he would become so powerful that the forces of Egypt would not be able to resist him, and no one would be able to stop him. He would conquer Israel. When it says the, the, the beautiful land, he's talking about Israel, and we see that 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 he's going to conquer Israel. He's going to hold the Jews and, and the Israelites in his hand where he could have a power of destruction over top of him. Uh, and, and, and we see that, 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 he, that, he, that he did that. That he would use his powers to force Egypt to sign a priest treaty in verse 17. You know that priest treaty was where he, he, he would give his daughter Cleopatra over to the king. And he, he, he wanted to do that so, so Cleopatra could maybe ruin him. That's what it says, that, they, that, that she could ruin him. But Cleopatra loved her husband more than she loved her father. And so that kind of backfired on him. 
So Antioch is the great goes and he, and he starts invading the Mediterranean Sea coastlines with the islands and stuff like that. And he gets beat down by, by a Roman, uh, Italian of Roman soldiers. And so he had to go back to his homeland. And then he would soon be killed after that. And his son, um, Cilicius IV, would succeed him. And the people of Israel were severely oppressed under this new king's leadership. Whew. Told you it was going to be a history lesson, didn't I? You can go back and look at that. I have no other way to get through those scriptures except to do it that way. Okay? And so that, that, that is a lot. But, man, I think this is a lot. And this is an important lesson that we can learn from this. I, I, I think that, that something really jumps out as we re review this, this prophecy. God fulfills his holy word. Daniel gets this prophecy from an angel. He writes it all out. And then historians can go back and say, look at this and say, man, it happened exactly as this prophecy was given. Exactly. Down through the centuries, God's given us prophecies after the prophecy. Man, he gives us these, these prophecies, these promises to help us, to warn us. You know, a lot of these prophecies have already come to pass. But there's a lot of prophecies that are still out there um, in the world type stuff that, that's coming. That, that God will fulfill, you know, his promises come true. God does not make a promise that he does not fulfill. Luke 24, 44 says, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. And all the things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And they will be one day. And so i got three points I want to talk about about the promises that God has kept so far. The ones that we know that he has kept. And the first one is, is that the promises that God has kept meet our needs. Meet our needs. You know, um, you know, as we all know, the Bible is divided into two parts. You've got the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament comes first, and the New Testament second. Some of us know where that, where that, where that joke is, is, is lying. You know, um, I had a youth one time ask me which one came first. You know, the Old Testament or the New Testament. When she said it, she, she realized that she made a mistake. Okay? And it has not died down because we are a church that hangs on to things. And so we, we know that. But, you know, and that New Testament is written about Jesus. You know, especially the Gospels. You know, we, we know that it, 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 it's about Jesus' death and resurrection. It, it's written after Jesus has died. So, so we, we know what, that, what the New Testament is about Jesus and stuff like that. And the Old Testament points to Jesus. There is nothing in the Old Testament that does not point to Jesus. There, there, there's types of Christ in the Old Testament. There, there's prophecies in the Old Testament. And it, it all points to who Jesus is. So we, we see that with the Old Testament. That's what it, it, that's what it was. I mean, it, it was written some 400 years before Jesus was born. It tells of God's creation of our world, the interaction of mankind, uh, of all the all the things. We know that in the beginning that, that, that the world was with, with Adam and Eve and everything was great and God was coming down and it was it was perfect and, and that whole little that whole little cycle right there, that's what God intended for it to be. But we also know that Adam and Eve started looking upon this tree that the fruit looked great and they 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 were seen by Satan and and they ate that fruit. What happened? Sin and death and pestilence and all these things come into play. They basically pushed God out of the garden. Why? Because he cannot be around sin. He cannot, he cannot be around sin at all. I mean, he, he cannot be in the presence of sin. He is holy and just and pure and right. And God can't be in, in, into the presence of, of, of anything like that. So they essentially just pushed God out of the garden. And, and so, now, so now we're left with, with, with all this baggage. We're, we're left with the sinfulness in, in our life and, and, and all the things that, 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 that happens. And, 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 and we're destined for hell because of that. God's not fit, right? And you go to Isaiah, you go to these prophets, you go to all these things. And, and, and the promise that, that God gave us is the Messiah. That one day that he would, he would send a Messiah, that he would send somebody so we can have a way back to him. Through, and he did that promise, and he gave us that promise through Jesus Christ. We can, we can look at that promise we can we can go back and we can we can see all the all the prophets.
prophecies and all the things that, 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 that he gave about that. But man, there are, there are so many more promises in the Bible besides that. I mean, that is the greatest promise that we've ever had, is that through him that we have a way back to God, that he is our mediator. You cannot get a better, a, a better way, a, a, better, a, a better promise than that. I mean, you want to know there's over 7,000 promises in all in the Bible that God has given us. Some are good. Some are bad. But they are promises. But let me, you know what? I, I'm just going to kind of run down a, a quick list of some of these. Um, part, he, he said, do not be fear. Do, do not fear that, that I am with you always, that I, I will be there. He said, I will give you peace. I will give you joy. I will give you hope. He, he, he promises to prosper us. Right? To, to, to help us. He, he promised to give us strength when we're, when we're weary and we're tired. He promised to encourage us, to, 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 to help us through our times, you know. Um, he promised to answer our prayers, and, and we talked about that. Maybe not, maybe not answer the way we want to be answered, but he promised that he will answer our prayers to come to him. He promises a freedom from sin. He promises the Holy Spirit. I mean, on and on and on, God gives us all these great promises. And, and, and the great thing about those promises is that he doesn't break those promises. He gives us these promises. Man, he tells us that he will fight for us, that he will be with us. And I, you know what? Greater is the one that's inside of us than in the world. And so anything that we're going through, he says, hey, I'm going to be there with you. Uh, I'm not going to leave you. And so we, we, we see all these promises that God has kept, and we can, can just continue. If you want to look them up, I mean, they're in the, they're in the back of my Bible. They're in probably back of your Bible, the promises that God gives you. I mean, I mean, Google it. You'll, you'll see all these promises time and time again. All the prophets have predicted things to come. And we see that God has kept them time and time again. Now, one of the things that God does not promise us is just to make us right. You know, he doesn't say, I will give you everything you want. He says he will meet every one of our needs. Right? So we, we understand that. The promises that God gives us will meet our needs. That's, that's one of the greatest things that, that we have. Second promise I want us to see, that the promises that God has kept were costly and required, required great sacrifice. Costly and required great sacrifice. How many of us have ever said, "Man, I, I sacrificed a lot. I've given, I've given up a lot." You know, you know, many people, I think they misplaced that 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 sacrifice. You know, of what they think and maybe sacrifice is. So, well, you know, I, I sacrificed not driving an expensive car because, you know, I don't drive a Cadillac, so I sacrificed and drive something a little bit less. But that's that's not. A sacrifice we can't afford Cadillac, right? I mean, it's not really, you might be sacrificed thinking you are, but you're really not, you know? Maybe it's a nice home or, or clothes or, or whatever it is. Maybe you say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast, but you don't have any food. That's really not fasting, that's a condition. You know, you don't have any food, so that, therefore you have to fast. You know, I, I guess what I'm saying is, is sacrifice is a choice. Sacrifice is a, is a choice whether or not that, that, that you uh, can do. When you give up control of something that is yours so that you can no longer use it for selfish purpose, then that is a sacrifice. Let me, let, me, let me say that again. When you give up control of something that is yours so that you can no longer use it for selfish purpose, then that is a sacrifice. Basically, what that, what, that is, what that is saying, if I decide to give something up that I could use, if I, if I decide to give something up, whether it's my time, my money, whatever it is, then I'm sacrificing that for somebody else. Right? I mean, I, you, you can't give out your surplus. I mean, God doesn't consider that a sacrifice. I mean, you look at, at, at Mark 12, Verses 43 and 44, and it's the, it's the, the, the widow's mind. It says, calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors in the treasury, for they all put in out of their surplus, but she, out of her property, put it in all that she owned, all that she had to live on. So, so basically, you know, an example is if you have two toasters and you give one away, you still have a toaster. 
You can still make toast. You're really not sacrificing the, uh, the toaster. Right. But if you give away everything that you have, if you give, if you give out your surplus, but if you give not out your surplus, then you are sacrificing. Yeah. That's I, I'm just trying to get to get to the point of having us to understand that the sacrifice that God gave us is not easy to keep. Man, that that to me, that isn't that the greatest sacrifice? Man, it didn't come cheap. It was very expensive. It required a uh, great sacrifice. You, you think about that, that journey that, that, that Christ had from heaven. You know, you don't know how far really that, that distance is. But I, spiritually, that, that, that's a big distance. You think that Jesus in heaven, with everything that, that, that is in heaven, how great heaven is, with all the, all the, the wonders of heaven and, the, and the, how beautiful it is, he, he gave that up to come to our diseased, depressed, you know, deranged world. He, he gave up everything to come here. What a great sacrifice. You, you can't, well, God kept that promise of, that, of his son, of the Messiah, kept the promise of, 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 of giving us somebody who we, can, who we can get back to him with. Man, you think about for a minute, what is the, what is the greatest, most valuable thing that you own? Just think about that. Would you be willing to give it up for somebody else? What God did with Jesus gave him up for everybody else. Even though that we are rebellious and his enemies, God's promise didn't cost Jesus money. It cost him his life. The journey was long and the cost was great. But Jesus kept that anyway. He, he went to the cross being obedient. Man, what a, what, a, what a promise being fulfilled, being kept. And the last thing I want us to see is that the promise that God kept are available to, to everyone. Available to Amen. everyone. You know, in Acts chapter 10, in Acts chapter 10, it is a vision to Peter that he gets. There's a guy named Cornelius. He is a Gentile. He is, a, he is a commander. He's, he's called a centurion. Where he's a commander of a hundred people. He is, he is a, 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 a very godly man. <coughs> he prays. He, he helps people out. He, he's a righteous man. Uh, oh, I can't. That's what, that's what this is. I'm not going to read this, this, this whole section. Just kind of give you a, a brief idea of, of who he was. Man, and, 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 and the angel of God came to him. He says, man, your prayers have been received. Well, what I want from you, what, well, what you need to do is, and, and in this vision that gives to him, you need to send three men to Joppa to go get Peter. Okay? Uh, you need to go get go get Peter. And, and so so then it kind of goes to, to Peter, and Peter was hungry. He, he was getting ready to eat supper, and he goes up to, to his rooftop, and he falls into a trance, and, and he sees the, the division of a sheep being lifted down from heaven with all these animals on, and it was told to go eat. And Peter says, look, Lord, I, I can't go eat. Those animals are unclean. Un I can't eat those. They're unclean. This vision happens three times, it tells us. Finally, the last time the sheets lifted back up to heaven, and it hits Peter. Finally, he gets it. He's talking about the Gentiles. He's talking about everybody. That, that gospel is for every person. Those three men come to get Peter. Peter goes to the centurion's house, to Cornelius' house, and Cornelius off, uh, invites all of his friends, his family. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a large gathering there, and Peter goes in his house, and let me tell you what, it was unlawful for a Jewish man to even step into a house of a Gentile man. Peter, that was unlawful. Couldn't even do it. And Peter goes in, right? And Peter goes in, and he starts laying out the plan of salvation. And he starts telling them, about, about all these people. In verses 34 and 35, it says, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one who shows partiality, but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. And he preaches the gospel. And the whole household and everybody around Accepted. The Holy Spirit came and fell on him. The, 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 the guy that was with Peter were amazed that the Holy Spirit came and he says, let's baptize. And he baptized them all. 
God does not show partiality to anybody. We're all the same in God's eyes. You know, Jew, Gentile, at this point in time, it doesn't matter because we're all the same. Our sin and our life, our sin nature, puts us at the even kill to God. Somebody who we think is worse than we are, somebody who we who we who we picture in our mind that God could never save, somebody that 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 that, that is out there, and we're like, you know what? Man, I'm going to try. I'm just going to write them off. We can't do that because God would never write them off. Yes, he does turn them over to their own devices. He knows their hearts and he knows that, 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 it, that somebody's not going to turn to him, that he'll just let them go on their own way. But there is nobody, nobody that God cannot touch. That's a promise that he keeps. And I am grateful for that because my sins keep me from heaven. Every single one of them. And the only difference between me and somebody who's in jail for murder or, or, or for any other thing that they do is for the grace of God and the promise that he has given us that my son is for every single one of us. You know what? As we look at these prophecies today, as we see these prophecies and how they were fulfilled just in these 19 verses, I want us to realize that the plan of God will always go as he plans. That God has a plan for each and every single one of us. God has a plan for this world, for this church. But you know what? You know, and, and God has a plan for us. And, and he's calling you and he wants to send you there. And we decide not to. Well, God's going to send somebody else. All of his plans, you, you can't thwart God's plans. If he has a plan for you, if he has a plan that, that's going to come about, and if you are not willing to do it, God will send somebody else. It will get done. Because God will not allow his promises to go unchecked. He gives us promises. And everything he's promised will come to, to fruition. It, it will come to pass. It will be completed exactly as he wants it to be completed. You know, God promises to meet our needs. And those promises that, that he gave us were very costly, great sacrifice but they're available to every single person that's the God who we serve please stand as our position